Today, I will uh, introduce two presentations in, in one, basically. One is introducing the basic flying skills. And the second one, uh, we will discuss a little bit together about doing manual flight in daily operation. Why this presentation? Uh, we have seen in some incidents and accidents uh, some phenomena with the aircraft, with the crew, and we discovered as well a little bit a kind of erosion in manual flying skills. So we see tendency that pilots are relying more and more on the automation and they basically don't fly a lot manually the aircraft anymore. Or if they fly, it's a few seconds or a few minutes per flight. Uh, why do we have this erosion in manual flying skill? Is it because they rely too much on the automation? Is it uh, due to other factors like uh, the environment in which we fly? As I may say, we fly a lot in a kind of, I will say, Romeo or restricted or reduced airspace. Most of our flights that we do now, we do RNP departures or RNAV departures. We fly in RVSM airspace where autopilot is mandatory. And then finally we come in and we land uh, by doing RNAV approaches, RNPR approaches where again the automation is mandatory. And in all those cases we see that the manual flying has been put to a second order. So what did we have in the past? I don't know if a lot of you flew this kind of cockpit. Of course, it's not an Airbus cockpit. This was my first cockpit at the time when Dominique started to fly as well, where there was no GSM, no or almost no uh, outlooks, no mobile things. This was just a basic cockpit where we had even no auto thrust, no auto throttle. Uh, the autopilot was very, very basic in my first aircraft. Maybe some of you flew this kind of aircraft as well. To do the navigation, we just used a heading knob. We had to tune continuously VORs to find our way to the, to the sky. As well, the flying, the aircraft was just able to keep the altitude. So we had to continuously fly the aircraft in pitch and in roll and to control the trajectory of this kind of aircraft. So this means that we were not only monitoring, but I will use another word now, we were continuously engaged. We had to do something. We had continuously to do something and be in the aircraft and to follow it in order to have a safe trajectory. The future, what do we have now? Based on the technology that came up in the 70s and in the 80s, we have now our very modern cockpits. What have we introduced in our cockpits? We have a panel logic. We have a dark cockpit philosophy. So you don't have to look to needles, uh, to lights, to see if systems are working or not. In our philosophy, when everything is dark, everything is working properly. And what do we see sometimes in training, that if we introduce some malfunction where pilots have to look or for a certain button, which is not eliminated, they start looking around and looking around to find it. They don't really know by heart where the buttons or the switches are located. We have an ECAM, so we don't have a flight engineer anymore who was following the flight as well, who was engaged together with the captain and the first officer during the flight, following everything, following all the systems. Now we rely on this tool as well. We have our fly-by-wire protection. So in a big part of the domain, the aircraft is protected. But we have limitations on that. There are moments that the aircraft is not protected anymore. And then we need a skilled pilot to continue to control the aircraft. We have, of course, our side sticks that we have introduced. We have a lot of new information. Uh, we have head-up display that we have introduced in the aircraft. Again, this has been introduced so that the pilot can visually see what is the trajectory of the aircraft thanks to the, the birth of the flight path vector towards the outside world. We have, of course, uh, improved FMSs, uh, able to do RNAV, RNPR, 
RNP approaches and even in order to facilitate the flying of non-precision approaches, we have introduced in our aircraft the, what we call the FLS, so the FMS landing system, where basically the FMS will guide the pilot along a trajectory towards the runway. We have improved the autopilot robustness as well. So autopilot, compared to the first one, can do much more. Even in the A350, we have improved the autopilots in alternate law, so that even if we reach a high angle of attack protection, the autopilot will and can put the aircraft back into a safe part of the flight envelope. And we are even thinking further. We are doing some studies to see if even in direct law, we cannot help you with an autopilot. But seeing this, we have more automation. Pilots will rely more on the automation, but the day the automation will fail, the aircraft will be further uh, from the center of the flight envelope and there the skills of the pilots are needed. Due to all those incidents and accidents that, that we had uh, in loss of control in flight, we have seen uh, Dominique show us that with the fourth generation aircraft the accident rate is going down. But one is still a big concern for us, it's the loss of control in flight. We have too much loss of control in flight and we have all together work on this and reduce it. The fourth generation aircraft helped us to reduce this accident rate of loss of control, but we have to continue to work on that. Dominique said well, we have a kind of accident on one in ten million flights. Why not working together to reduce it to one in 100 million of flights? We can do this all together. What has been published after the accidents and incidents, not only Airbus information came out to you with recommendations, but we had once uh, information coming from the authorities. The first one that we, uh, we share together here is the low speed at high altitude. Uh, the EASA came out with safety information bulletin. This uh, low speed at high altitude, why did it come out of this? Uh, we had an incident or an accident uh, a few years ago with an aircraft stalling at high altitude. But we have seen as well, due to weather phenomena, entering a jet stream, leaving a jet stream, having uh, waves over mountain area where the aircraft decreases in energy, the speed was reducing. This was not really seen immediately by the pilots and the aircraft went into protection and left the cruise altitude in order to return to a safe condition. This is why we ask you to do this in simulator as well. The day that the automation fails, the handling of the aircraft, the side stick movements at 38,000 feet, Mach point A2, are not the same as you do at 106 knots when you do the rotation. We see a lot that pilots, when they touch a little side stick, they do big movements. Is it for the takeoff or for the landing? But never, or almost never, they do small handling at high altitude. This is why we came with recommendation to do manual flying in normal and even in alternate low at high altitude in simulator. Simulator are excellent uh, duplicates of the aircraft in this region. We had as well uh, an advisory circular from the uh, FAA on stall and stall prevention. Uh, later on, Eric Fulawaisopt will discuss with you what we have done in the data package of our simulators in order to be representative close to the border of the flight envelope and even maybe a little bit further knowing that when we do flight data uh, acquisition in flight test, we do stalls with the aircraft as part of the certification. Afterwards, we repeat them in order to have the data for simulators, but we go up to the stall, maybe one or two degrees further, but not more. I know that uh, in the industry, there are some providers giving some kind of tools that you can implement in your simulator in order to de extend the flight envelope, this is not what we recommend. 
you have to rely and take the real data that we provide. As well, uh, Larry Rockliffe will talk about stalls and uh, me as well in the next presentation when we discuss obstetric recovery training. The ICAO came out with a manual on aircraft upset prevention and recovery training. So basically this is a document for the authorities and the ICAO is doing kind of roadshow actually as well worldwide in order to brief authorities how they can then see how you implement this. We have a program for upset recovery training that is in creation actually. Larry will talk about that as well in the next presentation. Then last but not least, as well, we come with our famous OTT, Operation Training Transmission, where we give you guidelines how to do some exercises with our products in the full flight simulator. Now, prevention. How can we prevent loss of control in flight? As I said, there are two ways to do it. Either we do it on aircraft design, so we already work on that, on flight envelope protection, having autopilots who can deal with difficult position of the aircraft in the flight envelope, to be able to reconnect, as an example, the autopilot when you are in the VLS, because actually on some aircraft you have to be above the VLS to be able to engage the autopilot. Now, some of our aircraft, like the 350, and later on some new models of flight controls, computers will introduce in our 320, 330, 340, and 380 family, be able to do this in order to help you when you come into some uh, difficult situation. We improve the alerting as well. Uh, what we have seen that in uh, most of in stress situation, one of the first things that is shut off by the human brain is the audio channel. We had cases, and we already seen this, that sometimes the pilot didn't notice that the autopilot tripped off. He didn't hear the cavalry charge. There was a red light, there was a cavalry charge, it was not heard by the pilot. And the same for the stall. Uh, we have an audio stall warning, uh, making noise and this. In order to improve the alerting, we now decided to even write the word stall in the PFD. So when the pilot is concentrated in this difficult situation, looking back to his PFD, he will see the word stall. And as long as he is in the situation, it will be written in front of him. And as I said all previously, we work on the automation improvement. The second part, which is quite important, is flight crew training. Flight crew training, we have already published the stall training video. I do hope that all pilots here in the room have seen this video. I do hope as well that all pilots in your company have seen this video. We worked a lot on that. It's an important topic and should be reviewed several times. Upset prevention and recovery training is coming very soon. This has been mandated by authorities. We are working on that. Um, actually, I've seen some simulators able of having upset recovery or upset position of the aircraft. Pay attention when using this. Some of the situations I've seen in simulator are completely, completely wrong. As an example, I was in a simulator and they showed us an aircraft at 15,000 feet, 250 knots, and we hit the button 40 degrees nose up. Immediately, the simulator put the aircraft at 40 degrees nose up. I tried to recover from that situation. I was unable to recover. So I said, this me a tough exercise of I must be very, very bad. So I repeated once, twice, three times, each time unable to come out of it. And then we start to analyze why. And what we have seen is that the simulator manufacturer, when you fly at 250 knots at 15,000 feet, you have basically an angle of attack of how much? Two, three degrees. It's easy to calculate. You look to your pitch, you look to the flight path angle, the little bird, you make the difference, and there you have your angle of attack. And at the moment we hit this button, and the aircraft was released, the angle of the bird was at the same trajectory. This means the simulator manufacturer is giving me an aircraft with 40 degrees angle of attack. 
This thing cannot fly. So I found a reason why I couldn't recover. And we are working together with our t team from uh, what you know, GO5 or the simulator data package, in order to come out with correct models that you can use. Crew resource management, flight crew proficiency, and simulator fidelity. Simulator fidelity use as much as possible a model the closest to the aircraft. Sometimes when we visit you and we do operation liaison visits, we have the opportunity sometimes to participate to simulator session, which is of a great benefit for us at Airbus, so we really know what you are doing in, in training. But sometimes we discover that the simulator you are using is far away from the aircraft that you're using. That the flight controls, computers, are not really representative of what you have in your aircraft. So there as well, I know it's a cost, but you need to invest in order to have realistic tools when you train your pilots. Crew resource management, work on communication, work on working together. See that the pilot monitoring function, as we already had a lot of uh, presentations from our friend David Owens before, is working well in your cockpit, decision making, and of course, the flight crew proficiency. On flight crew proficiency, it's not only just the mandatory exercises that you have to perform, perform as well other exercises to see how your crews are doing. So, back to the basics. How to maintain a high level of proficiency, as I said, through knowledge, to practice, and to apply it continuously. Skill, knowledge, and attitude, and remember the golden rules, you must be able to fly, to fly, and to fly our aircraft. Now, we'll continue with manual flight in daily operations, and what we do think at Airbus on that. <clears throat> so, one of the major questions is flying safe. Yes, flying is very safe. Why? As we said in present presentation, as well in the safety conference, flying is safe because it's a combination of four prerequisites, four important prerequisites. The first one, a safe design according to certification. At Airbus, the flight test division, the flight test pilots, the engineering department are working very, very hard on that to have really the safest design possible. But by design, we know that some system can fail. And when system fail, if we look in the regulation, we have a way to say that we can accept this design because the pilot is skilled enough in order to take over control of the aircraft when the system fails. By regulation, if you remember, a pilot must be able to recover in cruise in three seconds, in approach in one second, and in the landing phase immediately. The aircraft is maintained according to approved procedures. We have maintenance procedures. We have MMELs, or for you, an MEL. Apply them. As well, if you see things happening on the ground, because the maintenance is trying to restart the system, to put back on, and it doesn't work, you leave with the MEL. Don't try to do the same procedure in flight. There are maintenance procedures to be done, by maintenance people, qualified people, and you have procedures done by pilots. Information is given either by the ECAM, the FCOM, or your QRH. Operate by skilled pilots. We will just discuss this a little bit later, but pilots must be able to take over the control of the aircraft. And the last one is to fly in a safe environment, safe ATM. So if we have those four combinations, the aircraft is safe. Now, what should we avoid? Avoid the loss of control. So here I have a little video of an aircraft. It's not a fly-by-wire aircraft. Came, on, came in in an approach. It happened years ago. But here, together with a good crew, resource management, by having 
good skills, maybe we could have avoided the situation. Sorry. So the aircraft was in approach, was flying a little bit fast. Crew decided, enfin, one of the pilots gave the order to extend the flaps. The flaps were extended by the pilot monitoring. Of course, since the speed was high, the protection came in and the aircraft entered into a undesired aircraft state. So the aircraft began to pitch up. Uh, we see the thrust levers moving and we see that no action was there and the aircraft went up to a very, very high nose up. So we see that we went up to 50 degrees nose up. So basically they lost the control of the aircraft. At a certain moment they were able to take back control of the aircraft and they came out of the stall situation. It's quite impressive when we see it. You see up to 60 degrees nose up. The aircraft came down and everything came back. And this is what we have to avoid. If in the very beginning of that phase they took over control correctly of the aircraft and limit this pitch to 5, 10, maximum 15 degrees and fly the aircraft, we should avoid this kind of situation. In order to do this, what do you have to do? You have to evaluate. This was part of the presentation of uh, Marc Paris this years ago as, as well. You, you're responsible of your pilots, you have to evaluate them. You have to see what is their knowledge, what are their skills. You can do this on two parts, theoretical knowledge and in skills. For the theoretical knowledge, you have different ways to evaluate. By questioning them during a proficiency check, before or after, doing a line check. I even have seen in some uh, operators, before going to their recurrent check, that the operator is sending to the pilots a questionnaire of 10 questions, 15 questions, on very different topics. Not really to give them points like previously at high school, we have uh, 14 on 20 or we have 20 on 20 in the maximum, no. It's afterwards to engage a discussion with them, to evaluate that you as instructor, you have an idea of what is the knowledge of your pilot. Not only on aerodynamics, as well on performance of the aircraft and as well on undesired aircraft state. If you ask a pilot what is an undesired aircraft state, is it 5 degrees pitch up, is it 15 degrees pitch up, is it 20 degrees pitch up, just knowing what it is. An undesired aircraft state could just be not only linked to pitch, but just the speed which is decreasing. And you say, I don't want the speed to decrease, I have to correct it. In the skills as well, we have good tools, we have full flight simulators, very representative, where you can evaluate the manual flying skills. When we say manual flying skills, it's not just following a flight director and putting the autopilot off. It's really the full manual flying skills. It's flight director off, auto thrust off, flight director off, even bird off if needed. And they are just very simple, basic and uh, exercises that you can do that you did years ago when you started to fly in basic instrument flying. Ask them to descend at a fixed speed, at a fixed rate of descent. To know what kind of pitch change they have to do. Ask them to do turns. Even if you want to be mean, you can ask them to do a holding just using NDB needles. See how they are in threat and error management. In decision making process. In simulators, you can introduce some mean things, you can introduce thunderstorms to avoid change in wind and see how they dis discover it, how they work on it, and how they make their decision. This leads us to crew communication, that you still need a very good crew communication. Now that you have evaluated, what, what can you do? You can do training. You can start to train on the evidence that you have seen of your trainees. Basically, you should tailor every training session to the crew you're facing. Training on the theoretical knowledge, classrooms. 
either with two, with three, or with four, or when you do some kind of group sessions where they do um, exercises on slides, or you do have to do your recurrent training on door opening and closing, take one hour, take two hours. This must not be a whole day. It could be at several times a year when you can regroup your pilots and review theoretical knowledge. On what? High altitude aerodynamics. With the introduction of the JAR and so on, uh, we could have seen that the basic knowledge in aerodynamics was going down. If I look to some books, I will not say they are bad, but some publication that trainees now use to pass their ATPL, some of them are opening them and find some useful information. But I do know that some people, or some young guys, are going to a data bank. They are doing the 1,000 questions one or twice and just study the questions. And our time, your time as well, before we had very deep analysis of flight mechanics, high altitude aerodynamics, and so on. What is the influence of the Mach on the wing of an aircraft? Ask just a student when I fly a Mach K2, is the wing supersonic or not? See what kind of answer you're going to get. Definition of upset, undesired aircraft state, causes of aircraft upset. And we can use uh, material for that. You can use videos, you can explain, you can show what happened even in your airline based on flight data analysis. Uh, you identify it and you can show, look what happened in our company. You can discuss as well the environmental effects. On some parts of the world, uh, we have mountains, we have high winds, and it's really located on certain region where we have a lot, and we see this with aircraft, of VMO accidents, or MMO accidents, more MMO because we're at high altitude. Even me, I was trapped during a, a ferry flight from Toulouse towards uh, India, and I had in that region an MMO accident. Flight instrument failures. Instruments can fail. How to recover? What can we use as backup in flight instruments? Uh, as I said, we are working on technology. Uh, we have, uh, due to external phenomena, icing. We have problems of unreliable airspeed sometimes. And we are working on technology as well in order to have what we call backup speed information in the aircraft. For those of you who have seen presentation on the A350, when we have unreliable airspeed indication, it, be, it will be self-detected by the system and you will always have a speed information in front of you. Maybe less accurate, but you will have a speed information on you based on other uh, sensors of the aircraft as well on pilot-induced upset. Uh, there are cases, you can see them on several uh, investigation bureaus where they explain what happened to the aircraft. Where basically the aircraft was at high altitude, the automation failed, the aircraft was there, and if you left the aircraft alone, it was flying. But pilots had tendency sometimes to come into the flight controls and put the aircraft into an upset. And this leads me to a, a next example that we have, use of videos. Videos are very powerful tools that we have. We had and we have published the stall training video. As I said, I hope you all have it. You all have seen it. For those who are discovering uh, this uh, information, the new operators, you have our Airbus World Portal on the Airbus World Portal it's available. You can download it, it's free of charge, and you can use it. If you have difficulties on accessing our Airbus world, you contact your FOSD, and I will say it's even on YouTube if you want to see it. I don't know who did it, but it's on YouTube. <laughs> Next one, just well, as I said, a little example of a pilot induced upset. The aircraft entered into, was flying at high altitude. The aircraft entered into a wake vortex from another aircraft. And in this animation, I will run it twice. You have, on the lower left side, you see the primary flight display. On the right hand side, on the top, you see a little square with a diamond. This is basically the side stick. The aircraft entered a turbulence. And then we saw... Uh, the diversion, what the pilot took over control. 
And in the animation, you will see two aircraft. So we have some magic in Airbus. We can fly two aircraft at the same position at the same time. But one aircraft is flying with stick-free. This means autopilot off, but with the stick-free, no inputs. And the other aircraft that you will see is the pilot who flew the aircraft at that moment. So we have the vortex. Pilot is taking over control. So let's run it again. So you see that we can have situation where we come into an aircraft upset induced by the flight crew. You see the style stick moving all over the corner and you see what kind of bank and roll and pitch the aircraft had and the aircraft stick free was just moving a little bit around staying within the protected envelope was going to its stability up to 33 degrees bank and came back <coughs> now that we have used video for training that we have used other material to review what is next that we can do and that you have to do is to train the skills what is important about this training of skills? This is our flight envelope in which we evaluate. In flight tests, we go from to stall to VD or MD, which is the maximum speed in dive. Where basically you have to put the aircraft into a dive in order to reach that speed. Uh, Wolfgang can explain, and if you want to discuss it with him, he can explain to you point by point the techniques, how they do this. We, as the airline, Pilots, we work between the stall running and the MMO VMO. But most of the training is done in this part. If you look in all the syllabus, even in ours, we, we have to change this. But most of the training is done always at low altitude and between those speeds. But we have to extend our flight envelope to the corners. Because 99.9 of 98% percent, percent of the time, we are flying there at high altitudes and sometimes close to the corners. And there we must be able to recover if things are going wrong. <clears throat> so I know regulation is against us because we, not, we may not fly at high altitude manually, but simulators are able to do this. Skills in the simulator, as I said, fly in the full, whole flight envelope Start in the middle and go towards the edge. Ask your pilots when they are at flight level 380 to disconnect the autopilot and climb to flight level 400 or to descent while maintaining the speed, even with auto thrust off. Just see how they do it. Raw data flight. It's the best opportunity to fly without any automation in your simulator. Of course, we have some mandatory exercises where we have to do low vis approaches, but besides from that, try to disconnect as much as possible. Use uh, adverse weather condition. Do not do this in calm air and in cave okay condition. Use the means that you have in the simulate. You can use turbulence. You can use rain. You can use snow. Day, night, mountain area. You can use it. See how you can and use the training for that. Basically, evidence-based training. You can do things that pilots never do before. It's easy to do a holding with an FMS. Just try to do again a holding, basically. You can say, why do I have to do this? I have an FMS. Yes, they know how to do it. But again, it's practice to see how, they, how your pilot retained, what is the resilience, a word that uh, David used a lot before as well in his training. Simulator. Stall and upset recovery training. Stall training we have. Upset training, uh, together with Larry, we will discuss this. I will go, I will show you our draft or our OTT, the next one. We do hope uh, that we will publish it by the end of this week. If you have any doubts on scenario or things that you want to do as maneuver, don't hesitate to contact us. We have knowledge, we have experience, we have the flight test department who can help us as well. 
if you ask us question, can I do this kind of maneuver? Is this representative? Is the simulator behaving well? Don't hesitate. As well, don't change the simulator models without the cooperation of the manufacturer. Simulator manufacturer as well. We work on simulators. One of the most difficult things to do is the motion tuning to have the representative cues of the real aircraft. And I know that sometimes technicians of the simulator department are tuning down everything in order to save the visual system because this motion is making the whole thing vibrating, vibrating the lamps, the lights on top of it, and this is cost, of course, but there you are changing the exact model. And what the pilot will feel in the simulator is not a representative of the real life. The same for the upset recovery training, we will discuss as well the use of the motion. Motion are very accurate for initial acceleration, but a motion cannot represent everything and do not experiment. Now, the next one, we did the training, we did the evaluation, training on ground, training in simulator is to fly. We have to fly. Flying in daily operation. And we do recommend, really, we do recommend flying manually in daily operation. But before doing this, establish a policy in your airline. Give some advice that, of course, if you have Cat 1 real weather, 550 meter or IVR and 200 feet of uh, ceiling, that's not the time to do manual flying. But if you have KVOK weather, if the, f the crew feels comfortable, allow them to fly manually. We have no objection on that. You can use, put some rules to say, I want you at least to keep the flight director on. But let them fly if they want, autopilot off, auto trust off, even flight director off with the use of the bird. You have to decide based on the evaluation that you have done. When we fly, Dominique, myself, Mark, don't fly that lot. I can assure you, as soon as we can put out the automation, we do it, even in flight test. And as well, use your flight data analysis. See if they do manual flight. I know some operators, where they said, Xavier, we fly a lot manually. We encourage them. But we have sometimes to impose that they do an autoland from time to time, or that they use the autopilot, that they know how to use it in approach. And when you do your analysis of your flight data analysis of this manual flight, feed this back towards your training department. And again, redo your training. As an example of a situation uh, that happened, the aircraft went into an upset, not due to the pilot. We had a system malfunction. This system malfunction Tape the autopilot, aircraft went to an upset, those pilots flew a lot manually, they did some exercises, and you will see how smoothly they recovered from the situation. So the aircraft was flying at 37,000 feet, high Mach number, 0.82, it was at 3.30, and suddenly the aircraft pitched down more than 10 degrees. It was very brutal. They had some injuries in the back. The pilot took over control and very gently pulled back the nose and put back the aircraft into the correct attitude. Could have been worse if they did very big inputs into the side stick. Could have been really an upset. So you see what training can do. So to summarize, Prevention is a key. We have to work on that. Recovery skills need to be maintained. This is the last thing that you have, is the recovery. But we have to do everything. We have to train that we have to avoid recovery. We have to intervene before. Do not set artificial requirements. When you do training, you do stall training in the simulator, don't evaluate the guy if he's losing 2,000 feet or 3,000 feet. No, the technique must be correct. Don't look to how or penalize him because he's not staying within the limit. The recovery technique must be correct. Simulators, use them at the highest fidelity. 
share experience and scenarios. Don't keep them for you. If you have a scenario which is re working really well, you say, wow, that's great. I really have good feedback from my crews on that. You can share it with us or share it between you, you all together. All together, we have to work on the safety. It's an industry problem that we have to solve together, the loss of control, not alone. And if you need any information, don't hesitate to contact your OEM. And to finalize, I would like to use uh, something that we said years and years ago in Paris. I don't know if uh, a few of you were there in our training symposium in Paris years ago. You have to think and rethink training continuously. Thank you.